Today, scientists say there are about 200 billion trillion stars in the observable universe and two trillion planets. When the Pew Research Center asked Americans, do you believe that we are alone in the universe? About two thirds or 65% said no. They believe that intelligent life exists on other planets. And amazingly, 76% of adults under age 30 agreed with them. Polls also showed that 41% of Americans believe UFOs, popularly known as unidentified flying objects, are evidence that alien life from other planets has come to Earth. Moreover, 16% of people claimed firsthand sightings of UFOs. Even Congress and high profile Pentagon officials are interested in UFOs. In 2022, they officially broadened the name of UFOs to UAPs, or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, so they could document unidentified craft maneuvering between air, space, or through the sea. As followers of Christ, how do we make sense of millions of reports of UFO phenomena from around the world? Does the potential presence of extraterrestrial life and reports of alien abductions of people challenge the foundations of biblical teaching? Or might UFO phenomenon serve as one of the most compelling present-day proofs that a biblical understanding of reality is indeed accurate? This series is about UFO and alien abductions. My guest is astronomer and astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross who obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from the University of British Columbia, his PhD in Astronomy from the University of Toronto, and for five years did postdoctoral research at Caltech on quasars and galaxies. Join us for this special series you will see only on The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my special guest is Dr. Hugh Ross, astronomer and astrophysicist. And actually, we're using uh, Hugh's book that we're going to make available to you. Uh, it's called Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, talking about uh, UFOs and extraterrestrials. And I want to start this program with talking about the number one reason that more than 50% of Americans give when they say, what's behind these extraterrestrials, UFOs that are appearing in the sky, what we're seeing. And I looked at the uh, Gallup poll, and here's what the Gallup poll says. According to the Gallup poll, four in 10 Americans now think some UFOs that people have spotted have been alien spacecraft visiting Earth from other planets or galaxies. Now, Hugh, you're an astronomer, an astrophysicist. Do you think that an unknown human species from a distant planetary system has flown across interstellar space in their advanced spacecraft and come to our Earth. After all, many people are reporting sightings of UFOs and extraterrestrial aircraft all around the world. This is not just an American phenomenon you find it all around the world, especially Brazil, France, other spots. Yeah, it's actually much more common elsewhere than yes. here in uh, North America. And we're talking, you know, more than 20 million sightings. But the focus of that 1% residual that can't be explained by natural phenomena, hoaxes, or secret military activity, yes, the Gallup poll is saying four to 10 Americans think that's people, um, aliens, beings from a distant planetary system that have come here and was driving this is they're saying, well, if you look at the ancient Egyptians, uh, their technology is beyond what could be expected if they didn't have extraterrestrial help. People are saying that about the Manhattan Project, that the aliens actually helped the U.S. develop the atomic bomb or some of the amazing technology we have today. As one who has a doctoral degree in the physical sciences, it's like hey, I've studied ancient uh, you know, astronomy. The Egyptians didn't need any help. Neither did the Incas in Peru. Uh, they had the knowledge that they needed. But we're not taking into account of how heavily they invested in studying astronomy. 
much more so than we do today. Uh, and then looking at what we'd see today, hey, we have the technology, we don't need extraterrestrial help. But the chapter I put in that book is explaining why the laws of physics do not allow beings the size of human beings, even beings the size of termites, to cross interstellar space. And yeah. so... I'm going to interrupt you here because Hollywood's gotten into this game and one of the big things is Steven Spielberg did a movie some time ago and everybody remembers the phrase E.T. phone home. All right. So the little extraterrestrial that was friends with the boy in the movie, he kept saying E.T. phone home. The question that people ought to ask is if E.T. were to phone home, where would he phone home? Where would the home be? How far did he have to travel? And this gets us into the very question, is it possible for this to be the reason why we have extraterrestrials? You say a straight no from a physics standpoint, and I want you to explain why. Well, I have people that I know that are involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, basically using radio telescopes to see if there's any uh, signals coming from the planets that are near us. They've ruled out all planetary systems that are closer to us than 250 light years. So we're talking a significant distance of interstellar space you have to travel. Uh, but I've been talking to my friends who do the SETI thing and saying, wait a minute, you can't have intelligent life unless you've got a special kind of star. We've yet to find a star that's sufficiently like the sun that it could be a candidate to have a planet orbiting it in which advanced life and civilization as advanced as what we have is possible. And so everywhere we look, we see conditions that are completely hostile to the existence of advanced life and advanced civilization. Now, even if you were to be an optimist and say, well, maybe at 300 light years there might be something that we haven't checked out yet, and maybe it's just that we haven't been able to measure its star with sufficient precision, that's still 300 light years. And you can't go as fast as warp one or warp whatever that you see in Star Trek. The faster you go, the more damage your spaceship will take. Yeah, let's start with the simple question of what is the speed of light? You've measured it, and how fast is that? It's 186,000 miles per second. Let me give you the illustration that you gave me that hit me the most. That if you traveled at the speed of light and you just said the word hello, you could actually go around the earth, the middle of the earth, seven and a half times at the speed of light Right. by the time you said the word hello. Correct. Yeah. That's how fast it is. Right. And most people are aware of the equation E equals MC squared. C is the velocity of light. And basically it makes the point, the faster your spaceship travels, the more damage it's going to take from dust and particles that are in interstellar space. And if you double the speed, that's four times the damage you're going to suffer. And so you're not going to be able to go 50% uh, the velocity of light. You've got to go at a much slower velocity, otherwise your spaceship gets destroyed. I mean, one of the things we notice on the Hubble Space Telescope, there's holes in it about the size of a silver dollar. And you know, we're talking at a very low velocity. So interstellar space is fairly empty, but not totally empty. And so astronomers have figured out if we're going to send a spaceship, in fact, they have a serious plan. They want to send spaceships to the nearest planetary system. It's only four light years away. Uh, but they're realizing if we go at 20% the velocity of light, any spaceship we send will be totally damaged. And so they're saying, let's make the cross section small. The smaller the size of your spaceship, the less damage it will take from intervening particles. They've now determined the biggest spaceship they can send is 10 centimeters across. Which is about 3.9 inches. It's only this inches. big. Yeah. yeah. And even then, you're going to lose a lot of them. So the plan is, let's send a thousand of these tiny spaceships to the nearest planetary system, expecting over half of them to be completely destroyed before they get there. 
at traveling at only one-tenth the velocity of light, but they feel that there will be enough others that will only be partly damaged and damaged in different ways, they'll be able to get back some useful information. So astronomers are actually seriously considering sending a thousand tiny spaceships uh, to the nearest planetary and system. how long will it take them to get there? Well, one-tenth the velocity of light, it'll take them 42 years to get there. And how long will it take for them to send the messages back once they get there? Well, another 4.2 years. So this is a 50-year project <laughs> to get any information back. But it means that you're not going to be able to send anything big in that spaceship. Even a termite inside that 10-centimeter diameter would be destroyed by the radiation that it encounters on the way. And so the idea that beings to say the size of a dog or a cat could travel across interstellar space, we know that's physically impossible. It can't happen. I'm sorry if that ruins your enjoyment for Star Trek and Star Wars, uh, but that can't happen. Although there's one caveat. If you send a planet the size of Earth, there you can shield the beings uh, with the atmosphere of the planet, uh, but you're still not gonna be able to go very fast. And so, you know, practically, uh, that's not possible. Yeah, you were telling me about the fact that uh, we've had some of our astronauts go up to the moon. And if they were to stay there for a while, you've got radiation that comes from space. And what would happen if they stayed on the moon, which is pretty close to us, how long would it take them before they got hurt? Well, you and I are protected by a magnetic shield, a magnetosphere that surrounds the Earth. That's what keeps out the deadly radiation that kills us. But once you get outside that magnetosphere, you're going to be exposed to fast-moving, heavy nuclei cosmic rays. And they've done experiments with mice and rats. And what's good about mice and rats, they have a digestive tract that's a very good proxy for the human digestive tract. And they discovered exposing them for three months to the radiation you see outside Earth's magnetosphere. After three months, their digestive tract simply doesn't operate. The mice and rats are in excruciating pain. In six months, they got malignant tumors, and they're dead. So yeah. that's going to happen to any, unless you protect them. You'd have to protect them with, say, a very thick, thick uh, lead or uh, you know, maybe 12 feet of water. Now you've got problems. You've got a really heavy spaceship. And they've also done experiments where they put humans in a seven-acre biosphere. Seven acres is not big enough for a trip that takes a long time. Uh, people go crazy under those conditions. Yeah. If they went to the moon, how far down, if you sent machines up there, would they have to dig down into the moon to be protected just from that radiation? Well, that's the plan. They put a colony on the moon. Put it underground so you're protected from the radiation. How far underground? Well, you want to have about at least 10 feet of rock above you to keep out those deadly cosmic rays. And so they're actually thinking maybe we can send robots to the moon. They'll actually build that underground cavern for humans. Then they could go there and live in that underground cavern. However, they've done experiments. Humans in a small underground cavern do not function very well. They can handle that for a few days. They're not going to handle it for a year. Okay, now, we got the James Webb telescope that's up there. How far out into space and looking at the planets, if you're going to find life on a planet, something like Earth, you have to have a sun that is about the distance that we have, and then you have to have the moon. You've got to have planets like Venus and Mars that protect that planet from all kinds of well, comets this is one and of the missions meteorites. of the James Webb Space Telescope mm -hmm. to actually look at planets outside of our solar system and measure the chemistry of their atmosphere, see if they've got an ocean, see if there's any possibility that maybe life could survive there. They're looking at trying to find a planet that can support microbial life, simple microbial life for a short period of time. They already know that the planets we've found so far are not candidates for advanced life. But they're trying to see if the chemistry would permit the possible existence of microbes. Personally, I'm skeptical, just because you need certain kinds of stars and planets and moons 
in asteroid belts, even if you want to have microbes hanging around for more than a few weeks. Yeah. And uh, how many planets have you actually examined as astronomers already? Well, there's a list of almost 6,000 planets uh, that we have discovered outside the solar system. Uh, obviously, there's many more, but these are the ones that we've been able to detect, determine the mass of the planets and their orbital features. That's about all we know. And what did you discover? I remember back in 1995 when astronomers were finding the first planets outside of the solar system. They were very optimistic that they were going to find hundreds of planets just like the planets in our solar system. Well, here we are with a list of almost 6,000. None of them are like any of the planets in our solar system, which led to an amazing discovery. Not only does Earth have to be amazingly designed to make possible life on its surface, we actually need all eight planets to be precisely the way they are, the sun to be precisely the way it is, in order to make advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So everything we see in the solar system, thanks to these new discoveries, we now recognize is highly fine-tuned to make possible existence. That even includes the asteroid and comet belts. Talk about the fact that when your boys ask you to go to the movies to see the new Star Trek films or the new space films, whatever they might be, that come out, is that uh, you've gone with them. Well, I remember uh, we sat down and watched uh, The Martian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept commenting, saying, you know, uh, Matt Damon can't walk like that on Mars. The gravity won't permit him to walk like that. You need Earth gravity. And uh, you can't grow vegetables with uh, Martian soil because there's 60 times as much sulfur in Martian soil as there in Earth soil. And they said, Dad, stop telling us how many times this movie <laughs> is violating the laws of physics. We just want to enjoy the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how many mistakes have you found per minute in some of these films? I, but I told my sons, if they only violate the laws of physics once a minute, I can enjoy it four or five times a minute. That's stretching credulity. <laughs> so many of our people here in the United States and in other countries believing that we have extraterrestrials, you're saying that the physics so far does not support this as a solution. Yeah, the physicists and astronomers have studied these unidentified aerial phenomena. They're all convinced we're not dealing with beings like us from another planetary system. This is different. And they, what they recognize is we're dealing with phenomena that violates the laws of physics, and yet it is real. We're dealing with something real but not physical. The French astrophysicist Jacques Vallée has done the most study on this subject, and he says we're dealing with entities that are interdimensional. They're from dimensions beyond the space-time dimensions of the universe. He says, because any entity constrained by the physics of the universe must obey the laws of physics. And uh, these objects clearly do not. And we're talking the 1% residual. Yeah. Is there any other ideas that are coming up besides the interdimensional one that we're going to talk about? Anything else that is like this? This is the only one that I know about, that people are saying it must be from another far, far away planetary system. Well, the main reason why they're saying it's interdimensional, it's not subject to the laws of physics, is that we can show that this phenomena is real. And probably the best evidence is where observers watch the UFO go through the atmosphere and crash into the Earth. They go to the crash site, they see a shallow crater, if there's snow, the snow is melted, the vegetation is damaged, but there are no artifacts. There's no debris, nothing physical to recover. And when they see it going through the atmosphere at very high velocities, no sonic boom, no heat friction. So it's clearly violating the laws of physics that something made that crater, something damaged the vegetation. We're dealing with non-physical reality. It's real. <laughs> but non-physical. Non-physical, correct. Which, as a Christian, makes me encouraged because I see this as evidence against non-duality. You know, a lot of the religions of the world are basically saying it's strictly materialistic. UFOs are clearly demonstrating to us there's more to reality than just physics, chemistry, and biology. You know, I can hear some people saying that 
the reason that you physicists have not found the evidence is that the government has covered up the evidence at Area 51 and some of the other places around the Earth where we've had things crash. And if we could get the government to release it, then we could prove to you that this must be real and it must be closer than we think. Yeah, there are stories running around that the U.S. government actually has physical evidence of these UFOs going back to 1933. But what we point out is it's very challenging uh, for that to be covered up for that period of time. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, 90 years that this government's been covering it up. Why has nobody been able to produce any physical evidence? I mean, one good example is I personally have seen rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts. Uh, they've been you know, displayed in museums. People can see them. You can touch them. Nothing like that has ever been produced from the UFO phenomena. Uh, and recently, uh, David Grush, who's probably the one most uh, vocal about saying, hey, there is a government cover-up, uh, he testified before Congress. Every member of that congressional committee said, we can find no credibility to the claims that there is some kind of cover-up of actual evidence of spacecraft. And interestingly, David Grush uh, changed his story. He was saying the U.S. government had actual bodies of dead UFO beings. And he said, well, they actually have biological evidence. There's tissue, but couldn't produce it. Nothing's been there. And uh, again, it would simply violate the laws of physics for physical beings to traverse interstellar space. And the truth is, our government doesn't have the capability of covering up something like that for that period of time. I mean, President Richard Nixon could only cover up 20 minutes of an audio tape for 11 days before it got exposed. No government in the world has a security system adequate to cover up something of the nature that David Grush claims is actually taking place. Yeah, so summarize this in terms of what your astronomers have talked about. Is there anything else that's an option? Or are they simply saying, no, and we're going to go through this interdimensional idea, and we're going to tell them what that is. Is that the only thing that's left right now? In terms of physicists and astronomers who have devoted at least 10 years to studying UAPs, uh, they're all united in saying we're dealing something that's not physical, it's real, it's from another dimension, it's not constrained by the dimensions of this universe. Now, Within that group, there's quite a bit of speculation exactly what kind of interdimensional phenomena we're referring to, uh, but there is a unanimous opinion. We're dealing with something beyond the physics of this universe, and what we're dealing with is something that's actually real. Now, folks, next week I want you to tune in because if we've had millions of people around the world that have actually had a UFO experience, they cited a UFO, a fellow by the name of Alan Hynek, a consultant to the Air Force, started to put categories of what the people saw. And researchers of UFOs have used that list, and we're going to talk about the list of what people have seen and the categories of, that he has listed. And then after he did the first three, other astronomers and physicists and researchers of UFOs have added two more. We're going to do all five, and Hugh's going to explain what people are seeing and what happens. It's a fascinating program. I hope that you'll join us. But stay tuned, because i got a personal word for you in just a moment. Thanks for joining us today. Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He says it was because God so loved the world. He loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus came into this world to pay for your sins. He died on the cross and rose again so that you can be completely forgiven and spend eternity with him. This isn't something you can earn through your own good works. He offers it to you as a free gift, which you can receive through putting your faith in Him. 
If you'd like to do this right now by asking Jesus to be your Savior, I invite you to join me in this simple prayer. Just say, Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness right now. I believe Jesus is your Son, and that he died for all my sins on the cross. I also believe that you raised him from the dead. Right now, I want to trust him as my Savior and follow him as my Lord. From this day forward, please give me the strength to live for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, folks, one day I said a prayer just like that. And if you prayed this today, I want you to know what God promises to do for you. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's you, if you just prayed this prayer. And if you did, I want you to see what God says he will do. He says, shall be saved. That's what God does. He promises to save you. Now, if you would like to watch more programs from the John Ankerberg Show again, or share it with a friend, you can do so for free on your phone through our app. Just go to the App Store on your device and search for Ankerberg. Once you download it, you can watch this series again, as well as over a hundred other programs, anytime, anywhere, absolutely free. To find these videos in your language, simply open up our app and tap on the languages. Another valuable resource for you is our discipleship course. In this free 40 lesson discipleship course, our special guests, Sunder and Shamala Krishnan, will guide you step by step in through what it means to follow Jesus. Whether you are a new believer or have been following Jesus for a while, this course will help you grow in your walk with God. You can use it personally, in your small group, or share it with a friend. Just go to the JA Show app and tap on Online Courses or go online at jabible.org to check it out. Along with this, our app lets you read and even listen to the Bible in over a thousand languages. Simply tap on the Bible icon displayed on the main page of our app to find your own language. Once it opens, you can find your language by tapping on the second box at the top. If you have never read or listened to the Bible, I encourage you to find your language and check it out for yourself. The Gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a great place to start. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope you tune in this time next week for another episode of The John Ankerberg Show. Until then, God bless, and I'll see you next week.